installed at various places. Uh, this include in, in CSI ICB there uh, with Dr. Jaiti Sain Gupta, there is a 300 kV Polara with a 4K by 4K CCD camera. In IIT Delhi, we have a 200 kV cryo microscope with again a 4K by 4K CCD camera. In ISAR Trivandrum, I think uh, Natesh has a 120 kV cryo electron microscope with uh, CCD. And then IGIB, uh, Dr. Archana Singh has a 200 kV Lab 6 machine with a 4K by 4K CCD. Um, then, obviously, we're very excited about uh, the first state-of-the-art microscope being installed at NCBS under uh, Dr. Vinod Kumar, which is a Titan Cryos, where we're all hoping to collect data in, in future. Um, RCB, IASC are, uh, I think, in near future, going to purchase 200 kV microscopes with direct detector cameras. And then Ames is uh, purchasing a 200 kV microscope with CMOS um, with the uh, PI Subhasha. So the reason I have line listed all of these is to give uh, some idea that uh, we are we have a lot of users in our country, but uh, we have very few uh, microscopes, and only one state of the micro, uh, state of the art microscope at this point. So definitely access to high end facilities is absolutely required, and we also need uh, I guess more screening microscopes in different or maintain the ones that we have in order to initiate generation of better data. So let me tell you a little bit about how uh, our facility runs in IIT Delhi. Um, what we have in IIT Delhi is a 200 kV uh, FEG machine. This is uh, comes under the central research facility of IIT Delhi. Um, this, which means that from uh, 9.30 to 5.30, it is a property of IIT and there is a web uh, sign-up system, and mostly students from IIT will be using this, uh, this machine. Um, and uh, the funding for this was provided by um, actually an alumni of IIT Delhi who set up a, a trust called Kusuma Trust in the United Kingdom. And the money for setting up the, f uh, for purchasing the equipment and for buying uh, the machines, et cetera, and setting up the facility came partially from Kusuma Trust and partially from IIT Delhi. So um, once we collect data on this machine, we typically uh, store the data or analyze it, again, using the high performance computing facility or HPC of IIT Delhi. All data gets transferred there and we use the uh, programs, typical Reliant or Eman, whatever is installed. <coughs> in in um, HPC. Now, uh, when it comes to external users, uh, since this is not really a, a national facility, it does not operate in national facility mode. So, what we have essentially is um, is uh, some this uh, the time on the machine is available to my students and to external users, typically after 5:30 and on the weekends, and. Uh, this more or less runs for cryo-EM data collection. We typically use it for screening and some data collection. Uh, it more or less, less runs due to the involvement and excitement of my students. Um, and we have, a, we have a facility manager, and mostly my students are associated with external users. And uh, each one of them has charge of one or two external users. And uh, we have had uh, some interesting collaborations, as you can see. Uh, we are excited about uh, looking at things. We are virologists. We are very excited about looking at things which I've never seen before, like images of microtubules, which was a nice collaboration with <coughs> Dr. Tapaswana in Isar Trivandrum. But, uh, but mostly, we, we work, on, um, work on viruses, and we try to um, look at other types of samples brought by external users. So um, having seen uh, what is the status of the community in, in India, if you ask me what is required to, to further energize and that we are able to collect data and carry out cryo experiments, uh, these are some of the things that I've listed. We definitely need access, obviously, to high-end equipment. And in this sense, the Bangalore, um, the NCBS facility is going to be very, very useful. Plus, access to EMBL facilities, if uh, can, it can be obtained, it will be good for data collection. But uh, even before data collection, what is very, very essential is sample screening. And uh, like all different, all other techniques, in this case also, it is garbage in, garbage out. So 
we definitely require, I think, training in some basic theory, processing of samples, um, how to do reconstructions, and once you obtain the density, how to analyze the density and interpret it. And this is something that we have been trying to do through the sem 3 dip courses, which are once every year. It would be better if we could pool resources and try to get it done, um, I guess, once every year or once every six months. It would be extremely useful to all of us. Also, uh, some information about uh, requirements for sample preparation or a feasible timeline or even the feasibility of a project is, uh, in my opinion, uh, extremely essential. Uh, because right now, uh, there are a lot of good structures being solved using cryo So the information that comes is, well, you make three microliters of good protein and you get a structure the next day. And that is not really correct. And that uh, the amount of work that goes into uh, freezing a sample properly and collecting the data and analyzing it, I think needs to also be communicated <coughs> to the community. And that is why it is very essential in addition to access to high-end facilities to have screening facilities in India with uh, adequately trained manpower. And here also I hope that EMBL can help, uh, which will eventually save time at high-end facilities if we are able to ship good samples from here rather than taking up time for uh, screening of bad samples. I'll just uh, show a little bit of uh, what we are doing in, in our laboratory in terms of uh, <coughs> involvement of cryo-electron microscopy in, in virus structural dynamics. So we work on one specific area of, uh, of virus-host interaction, that is the disassembly of the virus uh, prior to release of the genome. And this is a very crucial step which essentially leads to the opening up of the virus capsid shell and the deposition of the genome, which is required for replication, downstream production of progeny viruses, et cetera. So disassembly uh, is supposed to occur in various steps. First, there has to be some initial conformational alteration, which leads to the exposure of some uh, membrane-penetrating peptides from within viruses, which break cellular membranes. Uh, this is followed by stepwise separation of nucleic acid from the capsid or structural proteins and trafficking to the site of replication. So what we have been very interested in and other laboratories are also very interested in is trying to figure out, we mostly work on non-enveloped viruses which are typically icosahedrons, so they have an icosahedral capsid. So how does the icosahedron break in order to release the genome from inside? And uh, I will not go into too much detail. Um, We work on two different systems. One of them is an insect virus called Flockhouse virus, which has a T equals three icosahedral capsid. And another is chikungunya virus, which is an enveloped virus, but it has a T equals four nucleocapsid. And we try to see how these uh, nucleocapsids or viral capsids can break open uh, to release the genome that is uh, inside uh, the, the virus. <laughs> and uh, what are the steps that are involved? So we are trying to do this in vitro. We're trying to set up, uh, obviously we do a lot of biochemistry and biophysics to initially set up exactly how we can identify disassembly intermediates. Uh, but just to show you one quick example from my laboratory in recent times, we have been working on Flockhouse virus, which uh, as I said, has a T equals three icosahedral capsid. And we want to see exactly how this virus disassembles so we can apply some heat to generate some disassembly intermediates in vitro. And we have been able to identify two different intermediates. Um, intermediate one, which essentially is a capsid, which is a little hole in the middle, so the stain is soaking in, as you can see from negative stain images. And another intermediate, which has a puff of RNA coming out of one end, showing that it is in the process of releasing genome. So without uh, wasting too much time, I'll just show you. able to freeze the intermediate states and do reconstructions, but the reconstructions are stuck between 8 to 10 angstrom, which is what is expected from the facility that we have, 
we can tell from these reconstructions that the viruses uh, have major alterations around their five-fold axis of symmetry. And by doing midsection slices, we can see that there are alterations in RNA density near the two folds. But what we would really like to have are uh, high resolution structures, obviously, which would resolve some of the questions that you're asking about how this and other viruses disassemble. So I would just end by basically reiterating what would be the requirements for the community is in uh, terms of access to high-end facilities and obviously some training and some screening facilities in India, uh, which would help in generating good samples for data collection. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Manidipa. Now let me invite uh, Dr. Deepak Nair from Regional Center for Biotechnology, Faridabad. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shailaja for inviting and Professor Vijay Raghavan for inviting me here, and uh, all the all the all the visitors from EMBL for making this trip, and all the fellow structural fellow structural. And all the fellow structural biologists. So I am at the Regional Center for Biotechnology, which is part of the NCR Biotech Science Cluster, located in Faridabad, which is not very far from here. And my research program, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my... So I'll tell you a little bit about my research program. I uh, am right now at RCV, but I uh, came back to India about 10 years ago and joined the National Center for Biological Sciences. And the aim was uh, to try and uh, uh, you know, start a research program on this following subject. So as you all know, DNA uh, has the blueprint of life. And, but DNA is also subjected to a number of uh, modifying agents in the form of uh, exogenous or endogenous agents that uh, distort the information present in DNA. And also during normal uh, processes involving the genome, uh, there can be replication errors, recombination mismatches, nicks and breaks, and all these things distort the information in DNA. So there are a number of molecules and molecular pathways which serve to correct all these errors which come uh, arise in DNA. And so one of the goals of the lab was to look at uh, a few molecules and mo molecular pathways that serve to maintain the integrity of the genomic information. But uh, as you all know that if the integrity is maintained 100% then basically the scope to evolve will be lost because evolution, as Darwin uh, uh, <coughs> articulated some 150 years ago, is that evolution, pro <laughs> evolution proceeds by selection of natural selection of variants. And so <laughs> to, for evolution to happen so that organisms can uh, survive adverse uh, uh, circumstances, there exist molecules and molecular pathways that get activated in times of stress, especially in bacteria and viruses, that fuel, uh, that, uh, fuel the appearance of mutations in the genome. And that was, uh, and uh, one of the clinical outcomes of such molecular molecules and molecular pathways is the onset of drug resistance in pathogenic bacteria. So that was the other idea. Uh, so. Uh, so this kind of, uh, you have molecules which, uh, <coughs> you know, maintain genomic integrity and you have molecules that render genomic plasticity. And this is, in effect, uh, outcome of what is uh, known in evolution as the Red Queen's race. It was first articulated to, you know, uh, understand how genomic fit uh, fitness remains constant even though the environment is continuously changing. And it is, so the Red Queen is a character in Alice in Wonderland who keeps running to stay in the same place. 
and that's it, that is basically the predicament which uh, organisms find themselves that they have to keep continually evolving to maintain constant genetic fitness in a dynamic environment and this is especially true of pathogens who have to continuously evolve to dodge everything that the immune system throws at them and uh, so the idea was to work on molecular determinants of genomic integrity and plasticity. There are molecules and molecular pathways that maintain the stasis or maintain the genomic integrity. And then <coughs> under special circumstances, there are molecules and molecular pathways that fuel evolution. <coughs> now there was a big problem in doing all this. Uh, ten, 10 years ago when I started is that there were no X-ray photons available at NCBS at that time. There was no home source and <coughs> there were no <coughs> high energy synchrotrons in India. We still are in Goa. So that is the advanced photon source that you see there. So the home source problems could be solved locally because uh, there were many X-ray generators available at the Molecular Biophysics Unit in IISC. And thanks to EMBL and ESRF and DBT, <coughs> we had this program which uh, Shankar also mentioned before, which is known as the BM14 project. Okay, VM14 project, which was a collaboration between uh, DBT, EMBL in ESRF, and that program allowed Indian crystallographers to visit ESRF and collect data at the BM14 beamline in Grenoble, in ESRF. And uh, <coughs> that went due to a number of people, one of whom is there in the audience now, Stephen, was very closely involved in making sure that this and plasticity and these are the, some of the areas that we work on in the lab high fidelity DNA replication translation DNA synthesis mismatch repair RNA virus replication and in case of evolution trans -indu stress induced mutagenesis stress induced epigenetic modification and transposition And we had decent success uh, thanks to the availability of the BM14 project. And we could publish a number of papers, especially on polymerases, uh, the activity of polymerases in replication and evolution, including viral polymerases from JEE, the Japanese encephalitis virus. And also use the uh, uh, DNA polymerases uh, as reagents to understand how uh, bactericidal antibiotics function. <coughs> now, the BM14 project was extended in uh, 2014 for another two years, and this is a picture of uh, Ian Matai is there along with Francisco Sete and Vijay Raghavan signing the agreement to extend the project for another two years. And this is a, this is a summary of the entire project for seven years. It went on for seven years, and uh, you can see from that table that it was hugely transformative for the macromolecular crystallography community in India. We can see the number of samples that were tested, and there were about si more than 60 laboratories which, accessed which could access synchrotron radiation due to this program. And more than uh, about roughly 150 PhD thesis submitting during that period had data collected, involved data collected at the BM14 beam. About 175 people were trained and at the beam line, and more than 615 structures were deposited in the PDV with 120 publications arising. So this table was made roughly in, you know, early this year. And more papers, uh, papers are still coming out which have data collected at this beam. Next. 
Here are some of the newer papers which have come out since. Uh, there's Deepti Jain paper in structure. She's also at the cent regional cent center for biotechnology. And Ruchi Anand's paper came out in JAXA. And she's at the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay. So the table tells very clearly how access to a resource outside India can be hugely transformative. There's no other word, phrase that one can think of for a community, research community in India. Now, <clears throat> in 2016, BM14 project ended. The BM14 uh, beam line was dismantled. And, but a new agreement was signed between uh, <coughs> between India and ESRF that allowed India to become a scientific associate of the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility. And now we have access to six high-intensity ID beamlines at ESRF for macromolecular crystallography and also to the BM29 beamline for SACS experiments. And as part of this arrangement, Indian structural biologists will also be able to access the cryo-electron microscopy facility which is uh, which will become operational in uh, ESRF soon. Next. And this is, uh, so all the people involved in this agreement are seen in the picture. To the extreme right is Professor Suzan Shubrati, who is Executive Director of the Regional Center for Bio Biotechnology. And it was he and Dr. Francisco Sete standing next to him who signed the agreement that made India a member. And in the center, you have the man who made the announcement, the Honorable Minister for Science and Technology of India, Dr. Harshvardhan, as you know Vijay, and that's Dr. Dinkar Salonke, who along with Stephen Kursak, has been, ha have played very, you know, very important roles in making this synapse happen. <coughs> so how does this help us? So here's an, no? So here's a quick examples of how it helps us. <laughs> what it has helped us do here is carry out time-resolved uh, crystallography to figure out uh, how how DNA how uh, how DNA polymerizes synthesized DNA, and this is a table which is come from a paper by Ariel Warshall. Ariel Warshall is the Nobel laureate. Uh, for chemistry in 2013, and along with Michael Levitt and Martin Kaflas. And according to him, these are the three possible uh, ways in which DNA synthesis can happen via DNA polymerase. It will be assigned to reaction which is either stepwise associative, concerted, or stepwise dissociative. And thanks to the ESRF resource, we were able to carry out, Jitesh was able to, in my lab, was able to carry out time resolved crystallography on DNA polymerase from E. coli, DNA polymerase 4 from E. coli. Basically, you grow crystals in your and you have the ion to start the reaction and stop the reaction at different time points, collect data, and look at the electron density maps. <laughs> so here's what you see. So this is the <coughs> terminal nucleotide and the incoming nucleotide, and the polymerase will stitch a phosphodiester bond between the three prime OH and the alpha phosphate of the incoming nucleotide. And you can see that uh, <coughs> there'll be electron density appearing between the two nucleotides. Keep going. Keep going. Here, you start the bond beginning to start to see the bond beginning to form. Keep going and the bond is formed, and now you see the other bond breaking between the alpha phosphate and the bridging oxygen on the beta phosphate. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. Next, next, next. So all the products of the reaction are here. Keep going, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so this is coming back to Ariel Washel's team. What our experiments clearly show is that, next, that DNA synthesis by DNA polymerase follows a stepwise associative model. Next. Okay, next. Now, <clears throat> as you're all aware, there are multiple challenges in India. Antimicrobial resistance is one. There are viral infections, which are very specific to India. JEV is a problem. Japanese encephalitis is a big problem in India. Every year, many children die of the, this disease. And there's a rise in non-infectious diseases. 
<coughs> and in case of plants, there are a number of pathogens which attenuate agricultural productivity and environmental degradation and pollution is a big problem. As people in Bangalore will testify, they have seen lakes catch on fire and other things, kinds of things. And the scientists have solutions to all this problem, but they are again limited by the simple thing is how to get the experiment done. And one example I'll show you quickly in case of antimicrobial resistance. Next. This paper came out in uh, 2003. DNA E2 polymerase contributes to in vivo survival and emergence of drug resistance in mycobacterium tuberculosis. We've been trying to express this protein, but it's really difficult to express. And this is where the association with EMBL can really help. Because access to facility is that, like the protein expression and purification facility can help us make this protein. Access to the structural biology facilities like the, <coughs> like the uh, X-ray beam lines or the XFEL source or the cryo-electron microscope can help us get structures. And access to the chemical biology facilities can help find inhibitors for these proteins, which may function as you know, dr new drugs against mycobacteria. And so this is a little bit about how the India EMBL partnership can help. In I think that we can keep for the next okay. discussion, huh? because we are really running short of time. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for a nice presentation. Uh, particularly, he brought out the gist of the India ESRF collaboration, and that can serve as a reference model for establishing future collaborations with EMBL, in my opinion. Uh, our next speaker is Vinod from NCBS, who has the best tie that is available for cryo-electron microscopy as of today. Hello. Anyway, I think I think I can start. So I just came back from Cambridge in July, and I joined NCBS after a wait of three years. So we we were trying to get the microscope, and it it took about it took about three years. Okay, it's come now. So what I'm going to talk today is mostly on uh, the work I did in Cambridge. So this was then, yeah, okay. Yeah, I will do that. So although we have heard that micros uh, electron micro mic cryo microscopy has uh, been revolution revolutionized the structural biology field, we still think that there is still a lot to realize. And uh, I, I will give an example on how this is going to change more. Example is from a paper which uh, I didn't, quote, but you can try to figure out what it is. So these people they started with about 7,000 micrograph, and then they picked about 3 million particles, and then did lot lot of uh, sorting, and then they got eventually a four angstrom map. So if I was to do, say, when I was in Cambridge, if I was to do this, it would have taken me about two years to get microscope time, and to to do the whole project. So this was done in a lab where they had access to microscope, so they could do it. So thing which we don't advocate, we advocate uh, better biochemistry, so you don't have to do all those things. So this goes back to what Richard in 1995 uh, formulated from theory, telling that all you for, for particles from, say, large virus to small proteins up to 50 kilodalton is only 12,000 
uh, asymmetric when you have 12,000 particles to get to three angstrom. So this was in 1995, but then uh, this number was revised by different criterion uh, to about 600. Or now currently we think it's about 800 asymmetric unit. If you had a virus, then you need about 12 to 15 particles to get to three angstrom. So this is from the theory. So this, what we call B factor, it's a total B factor, which is a combination of uh, image, the B factor from the image and the computation, which is the orientation error which you get from the uh, computers. So this B factor decides how many particles you need to get to given resolution. So this can be plotted, and then you can try to, uh, as you are doing imaging and processing, then you can try to understand how your protein and protein is going. For example, in this case, uh, which we did with Ram's lab in NCBS, you can see that after three angstrom, the resolution doesn't increase even if you add double the number of particles. So there's something wrong here in terms of either the protein or in imaging. So these different examples uh, show how, how well the processing agrees with the theory. So there are two factors still which we think is remaining in uh, uh, you can attain in terms of resolution and the particle number. The first of them is what we call an initial movement. So when uh, the beam hits, then you get a large initial movement, which seems to degrade the resolution. So ideally, listen uh, here. So this is something which we think it could be because of charging or stress release. So this is something to fix in the future. And the next is the detectors. Current. 0.8 frequency and then it drops. Yeah. So today I will give an example of how the improving will make things better using the example of yeast uh, ATP synthase. This is a project in collaboration with John Walker's group in the mitochondrial biology unit in at the MRC. So as you know, there are three different types of ATPases, B and A type. People have been working for a long time, so this. So F1 domain catalyzes the ATP, synthes uh, ATP synthesis and the F0 domain which transports the protons or sodium. So there are different types of stocks. So F1 have only one peripheral stocks, V type has three and A the A type has two. So the structures of many of the subunits is known. So the first one was the, uh, the F1 domain without the uh, without this complete central stock in 1994, which at the time was the biggest known structure, followed by the full F1 subunit in 2000. In the meantime, Daniela Stock in John Walker's lab also crystallized the whole F1 C10 ring also. So then John Rubinstein, when he was working with Richard, uh, got a, a molecular envelope using cryo-electron microscopy in this was one of the first membrane protein done in cryo EM, where John Walker's group docked these subunits. And my interest started uh, to understand how these missing subunits are arranged with relation to the other. But also, it's a dynamic enzyme which undergoes a lot of uh, structural changes. So, by computation, we thought we should be able to resolve most of these states. So, this is in 2009, Wolfgang Inger, he said that there, are, there could be as many like 16 states here. To make things simpler, we used an inhibitor protein to lock uh, the ATP synthase in, in one of the three conformations. So it's it's a coil-coil domain with ATP binding domain. So that the structure with only the F1 domain is known. So it binds to the central structure and then keeps it locking so that the, the F1 domain doesn't uh, rotate. So using this, we can also purify different uh, different ATP synthase from different species. So the, we decided to go for the Spicchia species, which when extracted in detergent, we get about 15 subunits. There are six transmembrane subunits and 500 kilo, 550 kilodalton. So this is how a uh, micrograph looks. So this idea, 2014, 2015, uh, collect a lot of images. So you can clearly see the ATPs molecule with the peripheral stock. This was done. Uh, is the Falcon 3, Falcon 2 detector. So these are some of the class average which clearly show the membrane domain, the F1 domain, and the peripheral stock. So as expected, because there was uh, heterogeneity, we did classification, then you could 
we see the emergence of three, three states, which we call. So I color coded the central stock into three different colors, blue, green, and magenta to, for different subunits. The inhibitor protein here is in cyan. So you can clearly say that they are related by about 120 degree rotation. So this is reflective of what's happening really in the, in the enzyme. So one of the disappointing things was that this got stuck at about seven angstrom. Even uh, this is about 100,000 particles. You can add more particles, but it never increased. But nevertheless, we went on to do the modeling. And then this is again to show how the inhibitor protein is bound to three different classes. And then how they, means the classification sometimes can be, uh, sometimes can be, uh,
And then for the gamma subunit where you can clearly see the side chains on the separation of the beta strands. Okay, although I say that the resolution improved, but in the membrane domain, we still see that it's not very good. In particular, if I show you this way, then you can see that the membrane domain is still possibly wobbling and it has not improved. Just finishing. Okay, so now if I go back to this plot, you can see that the improvement using the counting is very high, and then the curve here, the slope here is very low. So this is now doable to get to about three angstrom with less particles. Okay, so I just saw that in the future, in the next two years, we think that the, the directors will get better, and then the curve will go like this. And then with faceplate, and once we solve this problem of the first uh, few electrons, I think it should become more easier. Okay, so just I just want to show the facility which we have. Now we have a cryos there. So it's going to be open to all the users in India in particular from January 2018. You can do both single particle and tomography. And what we also are planning with FEI is to have a workshop every three to four months for about 10 people so that they can come, freeze a lot of grades, look in the microscope, and then go back. And when they come back, they should be able to do it by themselves. And this is the first image which we got uh, last week, and we are currently processing. Hopefully, this will become a pipeline, and then it should be better. OK, I finished by acknowledging Richard, who I used to work until about June, and then Greg, who is involved in development of detector. These three people looked after the EM facility, and SARS and uh, Eric Lindahl's team, who developed the GPU version of the Relyon, and Jake and Toby maintained the clusters. So thank you. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, just for the sake of curiosity, what was the particle that you showed which was collected at uh, NCBS? Which one? Which one? Okay, nice. Okay. So we are looking forward to some great developments in that area in the country. And our Next speaker is Dr. Stephen Kusak, who is the head of EMBL Grenoble Outstation. He will talk about structural biology services and research at EMBL Grenoble. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here to give you a, an overview of what we do in Grenoble and what opportunities there will be there for Indian scientists, um, when, when I should say, they join as an associate member. I'm going to sit down so I can play with the computer more easily. So um, here we are in Grenoble. This is our site. Many of you know this because of the BM14 collaboration uh, with India, between India, EMBL and ESRF. But I want to make the point that... Um, it's not just EMBL and ESRF on this site, and it's not just X-rays on this site. What we have, in fact, is four institutes on the campus, each of them contributing some complementary um, technique or activity in structural biology. And added all together, this is a unique environment for doing structural biology. We're all related by what we call the Partnership for Structural Biology, which now enables scientists from any institute to freely use uh, equipment in the other institutes. And this generates um, a perfect environment for structural biology because it unites, as I said, not just one technique, but a whole multitude of techniques. Of course, one of the key things, and I'll talk mainly about that, is, is X-ray-based structural biology. But in, in uh, the IBS, for instance, we have high-field NMR. There's cryo-electron microscopy, and I'll come back to that. But then all, all the protein expression technologies, biophysics, crystallization, isotope labeling. And um, in some ways, uh, all these facilities are, in fact, available for in-house research, but not only. They're all, all by different Routes, they're available to external users. And uh, one of the things we're trying to do on the campus is actually to kind of unite the mechanisms for access so there's one user, one portal whereby 
ex external users will be able to access any of these facilities. That, that's quite difficult to do, but we're trying to do that. And of course, all these technologies are used by researchers, but at the same time available for advanced training. So EMBL is, uh, roles in Grenoble are, of course, to help generate this um, environment, but in more particular to work with the ESRF on synchrotron X-ray based structural biology, both at the level of developing technologies and instrumentation and methods, as well as, of course, external user service and training. And more recently, we've been focusing on generating efficient pipelines all the way from crystallization to structure determination and refinement uh, in a seamless way, completely automized and automated, and I'll come back to that. And this is particularly useful for large-scale projects like screening of ligands and fragment screening, which is of interest in drug design. And the other aspect of what, what everyone is trying to do now at Synchrotrons is to make use of the ever-increasing X-ray intensity we have to look at small samples. And again, I'll give examples of that, as will Thomas Schneider, I think. So on top of all this at EMBL Grenoble, we do our own fundamental research, and this is mainly focused into structural and mechanistic analysis of eukaryotic complexes, in, in particular those involving nucleic acids, for instance, in gene expression, transcription, and virus, viral replication. So what we have an overall partnership for structural biology in Grenoble. We also have bilateral uh, arrangements, and in particular, very strong interaction ever since the beginning of the ESRF between EMBL and ESRF to co-develop instrumentation and services. And I just also mentioned this very successful partnership we had with India from 2010 to 2016, whereby um, we both together jointly ran the BM14 beamline, and uh, we've already heard about this from Deepak so I won't labor it, but it was an incredibly successful project. A model for India EMBL collaborations in many respects because it shows how such a collaboration can lead to a real quantum leap in expertise feeding back into multi multi multiple institutes in India, as you can see. All these institutes came one way or another to Grenoble and brought back results and expertise that they can then pass on. And just thanks to a couple of people many of you know who were really involved with that. So going back to the, the new uh, instrumentation available in Grenoble, there's been a, what's called the upgrade program from 2009 to 2016, which is what's generated these the now available six automated protein crystallography beamlines and one small angle scattering beamline, the, the ones that are now state-of-the-art and now available. And EMBL has been a major player in all this. We have scientists on four of these beamlines and as you heard, EM India, through its associate membership of ENCRF, now has access to these beamlines. So this is the so-called Structural Biology Village with four of the beamlines highlighted. And the names in green are the beamline scientists from EMBL who largely run these, um, these instruments. So there's... And, and all this generates... ESRF is still one of the major... is the major producer of... PDBs in Europe. So on, on these beamlines, EMBL has contributed a lot of instrumentation, and this is largely through the um, creativity of Florence Cipriani's instrumentation group, coupled with Andrew McCarthy and Jose Marquez. So here are the, some of the things we now got. So this is the new beamline ID30B. It's been going a, a year nearly two years now, and it features the new uh, high-capacity sample changer, the Flex HTD, we call it, which does much more efficiently than the older sample changers 
and more flexible in that it can cater for frozen crystals in loops as well as crystallization plates for screening uh, drops at room temperature. Here's, a, here's the very recently upgraded microfocus beamline ID23-2, only just opened to visitors again after refurbishment, including this ultra-fast, ultra-precise MD3 diffractometer, which was a good example of how we co-developed uh, instrumentation with EMBL in Hamburg. They, they received actually the, the prototype of this instrument and a slightly modified version has just been installed in Grenoble. And this is, has a credibly precise sphere of confusion, 100 nanometers. What, what this enables you to do is to rapidly screen a drop of microcrystals that could be room temperature, liquid, or could be frozen, um, and take pictures in a serial crystallographic fashion of large numbers of crystals where you get one, a few degrees off each crystal and put these together to get a data set. And this is particularly interesting for membrane protein crystals, and I think Thomas will say a bit more about that. Um, all this technology we develop is uh, often installed both at ESRF or Hamburg as well and commercialized by our technology transfer company all over the world. And here's a map showing where all our EMBL Grenoble derived instrumentation or developed instrumentation has been installed all over the world. Particularly popular are the high precision diffractometers. You see 35 of them from California to Shanghai. Another major development is filling the gap between crystallization and, and uh, data collection. And this has been done from both sides and meeting in the middle for the first time. On the, on the one side, we, can, we have developed a totally automated beamline, Massif it's called, where there are no users come on site. It's a mail-in service, and, and this is particularly attractive, I guess, for, for India, for way countries, where you don't have to send people anymore. You can just send your sample, and the machine will then search via X-ray, 3D X-ray scanning for the best part of your crystal, select that, select the beam size, go through an uh, intelligent workflow to define the best data collection strategy, and uh, all this happens six, every six minutes, day in, day out, on this beam, beam line. And the results are available in real time on the web. So as I said, this is the kind of thing that can really benefit uh, Indian scientists who are a long way away. And they can just send the samples, yet monitor what's going on in real time. And indeed, as shown on this map, That's already happening. As far as my figures I got recently, that there are 780 crystals from India that have in fact gone th onto this automated beamline. And I'm sure that's only a very small beginning of many more that are going to become, that are going to be sent over. The only disadvantage of this beamline is it's not good for training students because it's all done by artificial intelligence. We don't need the students to do that. But obviously training is um, a key issue and uh, we have to come up with ways of uh, improving training opportunities for Indian scientists when they become an associate member. The second technology that we've developed is this crystal direct automatic mounting whereby this is a schematic showing you, and this is all done by robotics, sucking out of liquid to minimize the amount of liquid around the crystals. The laser will then cut around the crystals, uh, uh, the, the plastic film on which they're growing, and stick that onto a sample holder, and then this is frozen. And this all can be done in a completely automized, automated fashion. This is the robot that does it. Um, on, the, on the right, on the left, and the freezing system which collects the frozen crystals on the right. Uh, I'm not going to show the movie in, to save time. But what you can also do with this system is to diffuse in small ligands 
while you're doing prior to the freezing step. And all, the, all added together, this makes for an ideal setup for doing highly efficient ligand screening campaigns, either using um, drug-like molecules or perhaps more efficiently doing fragment-based screening with smaller ligands which don't bind so tightly, but then you, you can find out where they bind and then stitch them, link them together to make drug-like molecules. The point being that now we can go from crystallization via crystal direct mounting, automatic mounting to the automated beam line, sit one crystal every five to six minutes and do this extremely efficiently. And uh, this is a new service that we are offering in Grenoble. Um, here's an example of a pilot project done with a pharmaceutical company uh, where we looked at um, kinase inhibitors, a whole series of them, and here is an even bigger screen involving a fragment screen where the initial fragments were selected by biophysical techniques and then I, uh, soaked into crystals. And again, doing this two-step procedure, you get a very high hit rate. And uh, so HTX, uh, the crystallization lab through Crystal Director Massif, very efficient. And this allows academic groups to perform the first steps in translational research and add value to their results. And I know that in India, I think a lot of people are interested in drug design and uh, could take up this um, new service. We haven't forgotten cryo-EM in Grenoble. Um, as I said, we, we think in terms of integrated structural biology over a number of techniques, so we were very keen to... Uh, Keep, a, keep ahead in this area as well, and we very rapidly in the last two years set up the EM, EPN Campus Cryo Project, which was um, led by the ESRF, who invested in a, a Titan Cryos with all the gadgets associated, but in, associated both EMBL and IBS in the project, and IBS already having a number of other uh, electron microscopes, including a, a high-end Polara machine. So now we have all these different instruments on the site, both screening, sample preparation, and high-end machines, which are going to be run as a single platform with a peer-reviewed access, like a beamline, to the uh, high-end machines. And as I said, this project went incredibly quickly, actually, and now the machine is installed it was accepted just a few weeks ago, is commissioning as I speak, and the first users are expected from November. So this puts us back on the map, not just for crystallography, but also for cryo-EM as a in place where Indian, as we heard, Indian scientists will also be able to, eligible to access this. And, and the nice thing is that it, it the... Um, It is an EPN campus project. The, the CryoM is going to be run by a, a three scientists, one from each of the institutes, ESRF, EMBL, and IBS. Finally, a few slides on research. As I said, we focus mainly on uh, protein nucleic acid complexes, and here are the five current group leaders and their subject areas from viral replication to long non-coding RNAs and, um, uh, extra, and SNRMP biogenesis and RNA modification enzymes. And all of these groups now are doing both X-ray and EM structure determinations. Just my own projects are on influenza virus. We're interested in how the RNA polymerase of the virus replicates the segmented RNA genome. I don't have much time to go into this. Uh, but the RNA polymerase is, uh, sits at the end of these ribonuclear protein particles, which are, there are eight of these uh, in, the, in the viral particle. Each one is one segment of the genome, which has to be replicated and uh, trans and transcribed, and the RNA polymerase does both of these jobs. 
transcription into messenger RNA of for viral proteins and replication of the genome. Two different processes, by, but done by the same machine. And, and a couple of years ago now, we determined the structure, first structure of this heterotrineric enzyme, which you see here, together with the genomic RNA, the ends of the RNA bound at the bottom there. I mean, it's a complex enzyme, and one of the interesting things it does is, is what's called cap snatching in, to derive capped primers for priming its own transcription. And that we could see from the structure how that worked. It's able to grab hold of capped RNA as it's produced by Pol2 in the nucleus of the infected cell. It has a nuclease to cleave these short RNA into short primers, which are capped, which are then pointed down into the active site uh, to be used as a primer to um, start off transcription. And um, the, the, uh, as with other polymerases, the RNA template is fed through the active site to, and, and NTP is added to the product in a template-directed manner, giving you, for influenza viruses, these chimeric viral RNAs with a little piece of host mRNA at the beginning. The interesting, one of the interests here, of course, is that this polymerase is a target for antiviral drug design and again, being very quick, we, we, we set up a, a company to do this, which was subsequently taken over by, by Roche. They continued the project. And uh, very soon in the clinic, we're going to be seeing the first influenza polymerase inhibitors, not necessarily those that we developed. Other companies are in on this. But we've been very important in, in setting up the basic... Means, mechanism, means by which people can develop these in an efficient way. The, in fact, the, cut, the compound on the right there is, is probably should be in, clin, in the clinic from next year, at least in Japan. And to, just to turn the full circle, of course, we've been using all our local resources to, to help us do this. We've been using Massif to get quick turnaround of structures of drug complexes with this uh, two-domain construct we have from the influenza polymerase, and um, where we, we have inhibitor, inhibitors buried in the interface of between uh, two domains. And so with that, I will stop, and um, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. A wonderful presentation. Very impressive. Yeah, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Schneider from EMBL. Okay. Is this on? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Hello. I'm also very pleased to be here, and I'm coming to you from the other structure biology unit of EMBL, um, which is located in Hamburg at Petra 3. Um, yes, so we are in a slightly different part of Europe, up in northern Germany here. And um, yeah, I don't have such a pretty picture as Stephen could show of Grenoble. So this is a space view of Hamburg, but you can see that we have a very big synchrotron because you can see it very well here. So this is the size of Petra in the city of Hamburg. And in fact, it's a 2.3 kilometer ring. And uh, that big ring allowed, it's kind of seven, eight years ago, to make the best possible X-ray beam in the world in Hamburg. I think we are still in the, in the very first leak there. There are other synchrotrons catching up, but we, we really are um, proud that we, we have this beam. Um, 
Yeah, this is a very similar picture again to Stevens. This is the DESI campus in Hamburg, where we have um, not very different probes. We have we mostly use X-rays in Hamburg, so there is Pet whoops, there is a Petra three, which is the the synchrotron. Then we have a, a VUV free electron laser called Flash that is not used very much for biology. And then we have the European x fell that originates on the DESI campus and has an experimental zone 3.8 kilometers further in that direction in a different state of Germany. Now, on the campus, there is, of course, EMBL. We are the only structural biology institute inside a synchrotron. Um, and then there is a number of institutions with which we collaborate or where we could collaborate in the future. So there is the Center for Free Electron Lasers, uh, science where a lot of the technologies are developed how to for how for using the free electron laser then there is the center for structural systems biology which was opened this year um, which is uh, working on structural systems biology mostly on on, on infection and then uh, at the moment that's the deep hole here the max planck institute for structure and dynamics of matter is being built and there will be uh, the hamburg um, Get me that right. The, it's the Hamburg, whatever, um, for, um, for bioorganic research. Uh, how, uh, Hamburg Advanced Research Center for Bioorganic Research. So that's basically um, a center where um, really Arvind Pearson wants to connect structural biology and chemistry again. So really, there will be chemistry lab, photochemistry labs, and so on to, to really get to the bottom of, of enzymatic reactions. Now, with that big ring, I told you already, with 2.3 kilometers, we are in a very nice situation because we have a low-emittance, high-brilliance X-ray beam, and with that, we can do wonderful things. Now, the EMBL Hamburg Outstation at the moment comprises eight groups. Um, there are four groups, um, Dimitri Svergum's group, my group, the Stefan Fielders group, and, and Rob Meyer's group, who have a strong emphasis on supporting the infrastructures. So we run the infrastructures, but at the same time, our research programs are very much connected to the infrastructure. So things go hand in hand so that we, we develop new methodologies in, in our kind of spheres of interest. Then there is another four groups that are more on the research side of things. Viktor Lamsen, Jan Kuzinski joined about a month ago. Christian Löw works on uh, membrane proteins and... Uh, then there is the big group of Matthias Willmanns working on mechanisms of translocation. Um, there's a special situation for these two groups, Jan Kosinski and Christian Löw. They have the little star here that indicates that those groups live half in EMBL and half in the Center for Structural Systems Biology. So they kind of bridge the two institutes. Um, yes, and in total we are roughly 100 people. Now, yeah, this is only a, a small conceptual slide. So both X-ray technologies that we are offering are conceptually very, very simple. In, in, in crystallography, um, we make a crystal out of a sample, we shine X-rays on it, we get diffraction patterns, and we build a model that is consistent with the data. And in SACS, it's basically the same. The only real difference is that the, uh, the SACS sample is, is a sample where the protein is in solution, and it is, that is usually much easier to make. And uh, some people say it's also closer to reality, but we can start an argument about that <laughs> later. <laughs> the Sachs Beamline P12 is run by Dimitri Svergun. Uh, High-end high Beamline um, with a very high flux, 10 to the 13 photons per second. It has all the, the modern Wills and Bessels, uh, uh, um, and uh, including... Uh, Pixel array detectors, so Pilatus 2M and Iga 4M. Um, recently, a multi-layer monochromator has been included that brings the flux up by a factor of 50, and that allows Dimitri's team now to go in a time-resolved domain. They can now collect a meaningful sucks pattern of a good solution in one millisecond. Time mix of, of systems. Um, so on the Sachs Beamline, there is one of the nice co-developments between um, EMBL Grenoble, EMBL Hamburg, and ESRF, the Biosac sample changer. There, in fact, production number one made by the company went to ESRF. This is production number two. It has been incredibly robust, and it has done more than 100,000 cell fillings over the last years. 
There is various bits of equipment that can be hooked up to the uh, to the beam lines, for example, a uh, size extrusion chromato chromatography machine, so that you can basically run your um, your into the beam of the of the sucks beam line. So the protein cannot be fresher than in, in such a situation. This beam line is fully automated and it offers remote and, and mail in access. So there should be no problem in using samples from here on, on that beam line. Um, so Dimitri's group not only runs the beamline, but is also very strong in, in making the best out of the data. So out of the experiment comes 2D data. They get reduced to a 1D scattering curve. And then Dimitri's group has uh, developed a great number of programs that can then build models that are consistent with the data, but at the same time, they now include more and more features where one can make the models also consistent with other pieces of information like homology models, distances from cross-linking, interfaces, and, and so on. And then, of course, one can also take information in that comes from, from other, other techniques like, like crystallography. SUX has become enormously successful over the last 10, 15 years, and so this is just a few highlights of the last two years that Dimitri gave me. Um, so it's used in many, many different circumstances. These highlights are mostly representing situations where one wanted to know Oligomers are formed, but there is also studies on fibrillations, there are studies on individual proteins, there are studies on ligand binding, so all these things can be done with SUCS these days. Now, changing to the protein crystallography beamlines, there is two end stations. One is called P... Oops. One is called P13, the other one P14. One of the 35 MD2 diffractometers worldwide. Um, that we use on the P13 beamline. Um, then here is the first MD3 that was developed between um, Ian Bell Grenoble and us, and what you saw on Stephen's slide was the MD3 up. We have an MD3 down. So the first design of this machine, we thought it would be the best thing in the world to put the rotation axis down. Now it's the best thing in the world to put it upward. We see what, what comes next. Um, but there is this continuous evolution, and between the very first prototype of this thing, which was a kind of a really ugly piece of stainless steel and motors, we had that in 2011, and in late 2012, we had this production number one of the device. And since then, we have used it, it's constantly upgraded, and I, I think that's one of the advantages we have. We can really drive these technologies very quickly and make them, make them useful. Yeah, these beamlines have some special features. The most important thing on P13 is that we can go all the way to 4 kef without too much stress, so we can collect data there for sulfur side phasing, for example. P14 has been built as a micro-focus beamline, but we also found out that we can make very nice big beams, um, and it's tunable between 6 and 25 kilo electron volts, so we can do all kinds of set experiments on, on small crystals, big crystals, medium-sized crystals, what, whatever people bring. Um, yes, all, all beam lines are equipped with uh, home-built robotics, so that enables then also remote access and, and remote control of the experiment. Now, I will touch on a few experiments we have done. So, seen that picture, uh, slightly mod um, modified by Stephen already. So basically in 2013, we, we pioneered together with the people from the XFEL in Hamburg, um, of CFEL in fact, um, a method that we termed serious synchrotron crystallography, where one basically takes a bunch of crystals that are mounted in a standard cryogenic loop, and then one does what we call serial helical line scan to interrogate every little bit of that loop and get all the data out of it that are possible. And at the time, we were then using the software that was used to work with the free electron laser data because conceptually it's a very similar thing. You just shoot and then you see whether you hit something or not. So um, we, we started this um, with the XFEL um, software um, and we managed to really extract useful data from five cubic micrometers of crystals. That's not a lot. That's one by one by five micrometers. So it's, that's a small microcrystal, let's say. Now, meanwhile, we have taken the same technology to our MD3 down. On the MD3 down, we can actually put the crystal direct plates that, again, were developed in Grenoble for the crystal direct harvesting system. 
we can put those plates in front of the X-ray beam with this diffractometer, and we can play the same game of collecting data, but now we do it in situ at room temperature. So we take the crystallization plate, put it in the beam, and collect data. In that context, another thing where we are proud is that we have a really nice user interface that is called MX Cube, which happens to come from ESRF Grenoble. The people who have collected data in ESRF will know it. Um, it's now the de facto standard on European MX beamlines, and um, it's really a very nice kind of sandbox to try things, but then also a very nice way to make it robustly available to users. So we have taken this serial crystallography idea, which in 2014 was run from a shell script that only one person could operate, to a situation where you basically you look at your sample, you draw a grid with the mouse, and you hit go. And it does the serial crystallography experiment. So in this case here, we would collect 65,000 frames. That's 400 gigabytes of data in three minutes. So that's the time scale of this experiment. Then you find out that only 40,000 of those have a signal. Half of those, again, can be integrated, and then you cobble together a data set. I will not go into details. Crystallographers can have a quick look. Um, then you solve the structure by molecular replacement, and it turns out to be more or less normal. There's normal R values, and all this can be done, meanwhile, in a couple of hours. So the experiment in 2014 took a day. Data analysis took several weeks. Now we are down to a situation for, for a normal case, we can do it in, in three, four, five hours. In fact, the, the, there is one interesting thing here. So academics are more conservative than industry. It's very difficult to make our academic friends take up this technology. The first unknown structure solved with this is now solved from an industrial group about three weeks ago. So they came with a project they couldn't do for a couple of years and then they tried this and kind of four days later,